you as well kind of just woken up um but yeah i'm just i'm just so delighted that um, i've had the chance to be here so um as i've mentioned i am a scholarly services librarian for stem subjects at deakin university at the moment um, and before that i was working for the nhs um I, I would still call myself a clinical librarian really at heart um which is where i kind of got into this work around critically appraising for anti-racism so as a as a librarian we do a lot of crit critical appraisal work looking at studies and how they um you know how if they're valid for, for their purposes um and that's just really when i kind of started realizing around you know the problems around racial bias and research and really how that should be um how that should be acknowledged um, before I start, I just want, would like to do um, an acknowledgement of country. So this is something that is customary that we do here in Australia. So I would like to acknowledge that the lands that on which I live today and which I'm presenting from are stolen lands. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm living. And that is the Boon Warung and Woi Warung or Warren Jerry people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the two flags on the screen there are the Aboriginal flag and the Torres Strait Islander flag. So these are the First Nations people of Australia. Um, and Australia is making an effort to um, right its wrongs. Um, and anybody that doesn't know anything and know too much about Australian history, then I definitely urge you to, um, to look into that um, and how its First Nations peoples have been treated in the past. So today I'm first going to talk to you about what is racial bias and research, um, after which we'll have a little bit of a break and a QA, and a and then we're going to take all of the things that we've learned and apply it to a little a little mini journal club. So it's not full full journal club um, where we'll be using our uh, the critically appraising for anti-racism tool that I've um, that I've developed. So I'm just going to get stuck right in. Um, so in this first bit, as I said, I'll be talking to you about racial bias and research, what it is and how to recognise it. Um, and I've been doing this work for a few years now, and I'm really incredibly pleased to have been able to write the entry for racial bias in the University of Oxford's um, evidence for centre evidence. I always forget the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine's catalogue of bias, um, which really can kind of confirms that you know racial bias is a real type of study bias that impacts study validity. And um, so that's the extent to which a research design accurately measures or reflects the concepts that it claims to assess and ensuring that the study's findings are reliable and meaningful. So what I've done is I've roughly um, divided the issues around racial bias within a study into three areas for today. So that is the planning, uh, for which I'm mainly focusing on the underrepresentation of minoritized ethnic po populations in research, as Safia mentioned before. Um, then we have issues around methodologies, such as the tools or assessment methods that are used and their applicability to diverse populations. And then the results and how they've been presented and interpreted. So I'm going to be going over all of these with you today. And I'm going to start with a type of racial bias, uh, which again, Safia touched on before, and I think is probably familiar to most of you. And that's the underrepresentation of racially marginalized groups. So it's probably not a huge surprise to anybody here that groups that are suffering from health inequities are repeatedly underrepresented in research, despite often being disproportionately impacted by health conditions and illnesses. So we saw this with the COVID-19 vaccine trials where minoritized ethnic populations were impacted by the condition disproportionately, yet they were not adequately represented in vaccine trials. And this happens constantly. And so I've just pulled a couple of examples um, from systematic reviews. So this first one here is a systematic review by Laurie and colleagues. Um, and this review was looking at the representation in oncology trials. And these oncology trials led to drug approvals, so cancer drug approvals. So these are really pivotal trials, really. Um, but Laurie, Laurie and colleagues found that in over a third of the trials, um, there was no data on race and ethnicity reported at all. Just nothing, nothing said about it. So we don't know. We don't know if there was appropriate representation. We don't know if um, minoritized ethnic populations were recruited at all. So, you know, neglecting to report the race and ethnicity in health and medical research really disregards the reality of social stratification. Um, of injustices, of inequities, and the implications for population health. Removing race and ethnicity from research might conceal health disparities that different racial groups might face, um, and it impacts generalizability. So we don't know if we can apply our research findings to all populations if we don't know who was included in, in the studies. And, you know, cancer does unfortunately impact different racial groups differently um, due to social determinants of health more than anything else. 
in those trials that did report on race, minoritized groups were significantly underrepresented. Um, and this can then lead to greater variabil variability in results as well, which can then be more prone to error. And again, this impacts generalizability of studies. And especially important since, of course, minoritized ethnic populations are disproportionately impacted by cancer. They should be represented in the trials that aim to save people's lives. It's literally a Black Lives Matter issue. And then just one more example on underrepresentation. Um, so this is another systematic review uh, by Goyle and colleagues. Um, and here they were looking at perinatal mental health research during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and again, the, the review found that um, white populations were very much overrepresented. Um, black, indigenous and women of colour were underrepresented. Um, where in over half of the studies, uh, white women made up over 80% of the participants. And again, you know, black women have an increased risk of postpartum, of maternal death and of COVID factors that would really all of them influence the results if these studies were appropriately represented. Another issue with this, another issue that this uh, review found was that a lot of the studies use really broad racial categories for its non-white participants, things like other or just ethnic minorities. Um, so this is very kind of white versus non-white, right? Like white is, white is the baseline, the, the normal, and it literally others the other um, others minority groups. And researchers should be aiming for inclusivity by providing comprehensive categories and subcategories, because there are many groups, there are many multiracial groups as well. Um, and where possible, they should be um, they should be represented, but also reported on. So that's it for underrepresentation. And I think that's the one that, you know, people are most aware of and it's, it's the one that we understand the most. So I'm going to move on to um, highlighting methodologies. So this is through the use of tools and measurements in studies. So different populations will have different experiences, different outlooks and um, different views. And researchers really need to consider if the tools that they've selected to measure outcomes have been validated or appropriate for diverse populations. Um, so the examples I'm going to give are kind of from, from my side of the world over here at the moment. Um, so this first one is around measuring dietary behaviour among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations. Um, so Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the First Nations of Australia here. So conventional dietary assessment methods are based predominantly on Western models, and these really lack Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges, methodologies, social and cultural contextualizations. We know, of course, that food is extremely important to us and often very unique to different cultures and different racial groups, different ethnicities. And so the way that we measure food intake and dietary behaviours really needs to reflect that as well. So this review by Davies found that studies have used um, the weighed food record to assess dietary behaviours among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So the weighed food record is a technique for measuring the nutritional content of food, weighing each ingredient before and after cooking, and then calculating the nutritional content based on changes in weight. But this method is not culturally appropriate um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It's limited. It doesn't take into account cultural traditions, diverse dietary patterns, different behaviours around food. So, for example, traditional foods that aren't commonly eaten by others um, that you know won't be accounted for uh, with this method. And it doesn't align with traditional food preparation and cooking practices. So the findings and the interventions that have been produced from these studies that use this method are firstly not culturally sensitive but they also then miss, miss, risk misinterpretation because of the differences around food preparation and cooking practices um, or the limited availability of certain food which conventional uh, measures assess. Um, my next example again is kind of from, from this side of the world uh, this time in New Zealand. So in this study researchers looked at the association between renal or kidney function and cardiovascular disease. And it found that in European and Asian populations, low renal function is associated with cardiovascular disease as well. But in Maori populations, so these are the um, natives of New Zealand, the risk of cardiovascular disease is high despite renal function score. So whether the renal function score is high or low, cardiovascular risk is high among Maori populations. So what this study does is suggests that essentially just being of Maori ethnicity puts you at risk. Essentially, Maori populations are different. And this kind of largely suggests kind of biological inferiority, which I will get back to later. <laughs> 
However, a big flaw in the study is that the CKD EPI equation, which is the a tool that they use to calculate renal function, this is a US tool and it's not validated in New Zealand. So when they did the calculation for its Maori po populations, they applied the African-American algorithm uh, because it's a US tool, right? It doesn't have an option for Maori. Um, so the accuracy of the renal function scores are now questionable um, because Maori are not the same as African-American. So as a result, the observed associations between kidney function and cardiovascular disease risk, as well as the disparities in risk between Maori individuals and the European and other individuals in the study, you know, might be influenced by this limitation. So inaccurate assessments like this can really lead to misclassification of individuals' health status, and that could potentially result in inappropriate medical decisions and treatments and so on. So if the study's findings are accepted without considering the limitations and the potential racial biases here, it can influence clinical guidelines, healthcare practices, resource allocation, and this can have direct consequences for the healthcare provided to Maori individuals, potentially leading to inaccurate, in, inadequate and inappropriate care, which is the problem that they're all already facing anyway. And there are lots of other types of assessments um, to look out for in studies, you know, patient reported outcomes, mental health assessment, language communication. Um, these are all these are all things that can be interpreted differently by different groups and therefore they must be appropriate, preferably validated for diverse populations. But even tools that measure phys physicality, so like oxygen saturation, um, where the pulse oximeter has been shown to be less accurate on people with darker skin, you know, all these things need to be taken into consideration. And so that then brings me to the kind of third issue, which is around the um, racial bias and the interpretation of results data. So before I kind of go into that too much, I really need everyone to understand, um, you know, when it comes to racial differences and health outcomes, first we need to understand like what is race and how does it impact health status? So race is, um, race is a social construct. And race was essentially invented um, mostly to legitimate, uh, legitimize white rule through kind of hierarchical divisions. Race is not biological. And in 2003, the Human Genome Project essentially proved this to the world, that race is not a biological concept. But despite that, you know, historical scientific racism has really fueled discriminatory beliefs for centuries now. So from the slave trade to the Second World War, um, these kind of beliefs justified racial discrimination in various forms due to the belief that some races are biologically superior or inferior to others. And these principles, they persist today and they contribute to enduring stereotypes and biases. And it's really important for us to understand that race has no biological grounding at all. But if race isn't biological, then why are minoritized ethnic populations more likely to suffer from certain conditions, diseases, coronaviruses, and so on? So, you know, we acknowledge that race is a social construct, but it is still a social reality that leads to disparities and social determinants of health. So structural, institutional, interpersonal forms of racism cause health disparities. So this is around the access to and the experiences of employment, housing, healthcare, education, and of course, not to mention overt racism and the impact that it has on health. So that's kind of a background on like, what is race? Um, and then that brings me to my first issue um, around the interpretation of results data. So the first one is around the stratification of results data by race, by default. So obviously we want race and ethnicity data collected. We've already, um, we've already confirmed that. But the decision to stratify the results by race in a study really just need to be guided by the research objectives and should be made thoughtfully to avoid unintended consequences, ethical concerns and potential misinterpretation of data. So presenting race based stratifications without a clear purpose can lead to misinterpretation of results. You know, people can draw unwarranted conclusions about the significance of race differences and outcomes if they haven't been properly explained. If in a results table, it just tells us the difference between racial groups and their health outcomes without explaining why that might be, you know, especially if, the fo if that's not the focus of the study. Race can be a confounding variable, but presenting the results alone really doesn't tell us much at all. Um, it, will, it leads people to their own conclusions about why this has happened. So to reduce unintentional bias, 
um, the reporting of results regarding race and ethnicity shouldn't be considered in isolation, um, but accompanied by reporting of other socio-demographic socio-demographic factors and social determinants, um, including concerns about racism, disparities, inequities, and so on. So when reporting on race and ethnic disparities, authors really need to provide a balanced, evidence-based discussion of the implications of the findings for addressing institutional racism, structural racism, and how they might affect the study population and its health outcomes. Race shouldn't simply, your results, sorry, shouldn't simply be adjusted for race without any explanation. This is almost done automatically at this point. Um, how often do you see in a study that results were adjusted for race? And how often is it explained why that would happen? Um, it's really very suggestive that race is concrete and a biological reason for health disparities if we're going to start kind of adjusting for race without, you know, without explaining why. And then this leads me quite nicely to the issue of using race as a proxy for genetic ancestry. So, as I said, um, race has nothing to do with genetics or biology, right? It's a social construct. Um, it's very socially real, but it's not biologically real. Race is fluid. It concerns identity. Um, so it's all it's all around the social construct. Genetics um, and genetic variants can be passed down through ancestry. Um, but race is not the cause for genetic variants. It's just that people from the same racial group tend to cluster, right? People with the same background, same religion, same culture, you tend, people tend, tend to stick together. So if there is a genetic variant, it may become more prominent in some groups. But it's not because they are a certain race. It's because that genetic variant has been passed down through ancestry. Race doesn't affect that at all. Um, my mother is white. She can pass down something to me um, just as easily as if she were black. You know, it, make, it makes no difference on race. It's all around genetic ancestry. But there are, there are just loads and loads of examples of reported associations between race and ethnicity and, and health outcomes. Um, but these aren't related to race. They're related to ancestry or social determinants of health. Um, but a lot of studies, such as those on the screen, I've just taken two excerpts there, um, they conflate race and ethnicity with genetic ancestry. And it's just simply incorrect. Claiming that race is biologic, is biological and claiming that races are biologically different is a slippery slope to claiming that some races are biologically inferior or superior than others. And we've been there. And we don't want to go back. So if research concludes on possible genetic differences between groups, researchers need to refer to genetic ancestry, not to race and not to ethnicity either. And if they are concluding with genetic differences between racial between any type of group, then really they need to be doing appropriate genetic testing. Right. Um, because that's the proper way to determine that there are genetic differences in the most valid way possible. But really, most importantly, race is not the same as genetic ancestry and researchers should not be using race as a proxy for genetic ancestry. If they're looking at genetics in a study, they need to conduct genetic testing on their participants for accurate results and not rely on race and not rely on self-reported race either. Self-reported race is personal and correct for that person, um, but it might not necessarily align with their genetic ancestry. Um, mine certainly doesn't. And, you know, do not use self-identified race in place of genetic testing because they're not the same thing and it's just not going to be accurate. And then your study results are no longer valid because you've used an inappropriate measure. So we've had a look at um, the issues. So we've divided into three. We've had a look at those. And then how does this actually, what is the impact of those issues? Um, how does this actually impact study validity and therefore justify inclusion in the critical appraisal process as well? So, yeah, so racial bias does impact study validity. So it's a very wordy slide um, and it can be linked to various other types of study bias as well. So if you've done any critical appraisal, um, you'll, you'll know about different types of study bias and racial bias can really be linked to a lot of them as well. So linking to underrepresentation, which we talked about earlier, uh, we have selection bias, ascertainment bias, referral filter bias. So these are all distortions in the way that participants are selected. And these tend to impact the generalizability of a study. And that then leads to skewed findings. Um, linking to the different types of tools and measures, which I talked about in the middle, um, we have criterion and construct validity, uh, detection bias, spectrum bias. These are all measures. Uh, tests, assessments, 
about how suitable uh, they might be for a population or measuring outcomes. So construct validity also relates to genetic testing. So, you know, the only way to determine genetic differences is through genetic testing. Um, and then that would be um, const construct validity. Um, confounding bias and confirmation bias, they relate to inappropriate interpretation of results. Um, and then we have spin bias and inappropriate subgroup analysis. And these are also around the interpretation, but more key to kind of racial data stratification without any justification for it, especially when racial subgroups are underrepresented, as they so often are, which then can lead to false positives as well. Um, but unfortunately, racial bias doesn't just impact study validity, also impacts ethics. Um, we've discussed um, kind of most of this already. So minoritized populations are constantly underrepresented in research, even though they bear the brunt of many conditions. And researchers, they have a duty to ensure that all groups are served by their research. Um, we, you know, we also definitely don't want to resurrect any dangerous ideas around biological superiority or inferiority, as we said. Um, and we don't also, a big risk is embedding the idea of racial biological fact um, into the healthcare system. And this is something that happens, and it's, it's already happened, it happens um, constantly. So what I have here on the screen are some different tools. Um, because really the impact of race-based medicine is best understood by examining real world race correction treatment algorithms, which are based on research findings, including the interpretation of that research as well. So um, algorithms include, at the top we have a breast cancer risk calculator. So this, um, this calculator places white women at a higher risk of breast cancer. Um, and what that then does is essentially discourages more rigorous screening for non-white women. Um, and of course, surprise, surprise, minoritized ethnic women are more likely to die from breast cancer. Um, second, there's a calculator which is used to estimate the complications during cardiac surgery. And this places ethnic minorities at a higher risk. Um, and what this does then is steers minority patients away from surgery, despite the authors of the tool, the study that it's, the studies that it's based on, they do not understand why these they don't understand the underlying mechanisms of these different so we don't even understand it but they've been popped into the tool anyway and then we have the united states uh, kidney donor risk index tool so this tool uses african-american race to predict kidney graft failure so if you're african-american you're more likely to have kidney graft failure and what this does is it reduces the pool of donations from this population and therefore because African-Americans receive kidney donations from African-Americans, uh, it also reduces the amount of kidneys available for African-American patients. And of course, waiting lists for African-American patients are much longer than they are for white populations. So using race like this prevents us from developing appropriate interventions. It's like, OK, well, you're black and there's nothing that can be done about that. Um, so, you know, this tool is now being applied, even though race is not biologically real. Um, and a lot of the reasons around the disparities are because of social determinants of health, which we can produce interventions for. But once tools like this exist, it stops us from doing that. So we've got many medical treatments, tests, tools. They often use these fixed racial categories. And this promotes the idea that illnesses have distinct mechanisms based on race. And this kind of practice results in treating patients differently based on their racial classification. And it masks the real cause of racial disparities. They fail to acknowledge the impact of social and environmental factors on racial health differences. And they don't highlight the potential harm of using race in medical decision making. Something which personally gets to me is that the calculators and tools, they often lack a scientific basis for determining which race to import when a patient has one black parent and one from another race. You know, what, what decision do clinicians go with there? Do we have the one drop rule? Has my blood been quote unquote dirtied or am I safe? You know, which genetics did I get here? Um, so, so yeah, so we've gone through the different issues and how they impact, um, you know, how they can impact kind of real world decision making as well. Um, and so after kind of finding out about all of this, what I did is I developed a tool 
Um, so it's I've called it the critically appraising for anti-racism tool. <laughs> um, and this is the, what we're going to be using for the journal club activity later as well. So the tool is just um, six questions with prompts and ex explanations at the end. Um, and it kind of covers everything that I've spoken about today. So to develop the tool, I held a workshop um, and tested it out, um, improved on it. And I've used it since in kind of journal clubs just to see, you know, obviously if it works well. So um, it has been used now uh, by a number of different um, researchers. So hopefully um, you'll find it useful as well when we, when we are going to use the questions from it later. And that's it. That's it for me for the first bit. OK, thanks very much, 